This lecture is on German opera, and it involves Karl Maria von Weber's Der Freischütz, as well as Richard Wagner's Tristan and Isolde. Just a little background on German opera in the Romantic period. Um, you have to remember that German language opera just began in 1791. That's much later than Italian and French opera, and we remember that from the Magic Flute and a little later on uh, in the classical period of Beethoven's Fidelio. What we noticed was as the vowel-laden Italian language defined the nature of operatic singing and drama much earlier than the German language opera. But Romantic German opera grew out of a German musical theater tradition known as Singspiel, whereas you would have some the singing, and then you would have speaking or dialogue. Well, in the musical theater aspect of it, initially, it was more speaking and then singing. And then we notice with the operas, there's more singing and less speaking. The De Freischitz by Karl Maria von Weber, the part that I would like you to actually uh, see on a YouTube, and it's in two parts. That's the best um, version of the Wolf Glen scene. It is a scene that actually is the kind of like the very famous scene of showing how so many things can be um, experienced by the orchestral background of what's happening and not so much the singing aspect. But in this Wolf Glen scene of the De Freischütz, which is translated as the Free Shooter, which was an opera by Karl Maria von Weber in 1821, Casper and Max are marksmen. They are rangers. Casper's doing great. He is like, his aim is great. He's doing well, but Max is not. And Max really wants to win the hand of Agatha, the daughter of the head ranger. So Casper says, look, I think I have a solution for you. So he, says, so he goes into the Wolf Glen um, area, which is a very supernatural area, and he calls on the devil. Now you gotta remember that Casper, even though you don't realize this, has already sold his soul to the devil. And his time is almost up. So he figures he can make a deal with the devil by getting Max kind of like to agree to um, using these magic bullets and selling his soul to the devil um, and maybe by himself sometime as well. I don't know if you really want to bargain with the devil, but Casper tries because his time is almost up. And as you know, because he sold his soul to the devil, he was able to do anything that he wanted and in this case be a very fine free shooter. So what happens is, is he, the Wolf Glen scene actually shows you the devil coming, and you're going to notice the devil does not speak. And if you remember from Hildegard, the devil does not speak. So this is very interesting, this concept of the devil always kind of having that sense that um, it's just basically a dialogue with the devil. But what happens in this scene is, is that there's the creation of the seven magic bullets. The seventh one is the devil's bullet. And what happens is, is that um, Max agrees to the, using these bullets. When he gets to the seventh bullet, by accident he hits Agatha, who is, but he, luckily she's wearing this wreath on her head. And because of that, she is saved. The bullet ricochets off of the wreath and kills Casper. So even though Casper thought he was going to get a couple more years out of this contract, he did not. When you're, um, the, the importance of this um, opera is, is we know definitely that uh, Karl Maria von Weber influenced Berlioz, Liszt, and Wagner. And the De Freischitz exemplifies many characteristics of German romantic opera, meaning what you see in this opera, you see in a lot of other German opera. Number one, the plots are drawn from medieval legend, history, or fairy tale. Number two, there's nature is involved. Number three, the story usually involves supernatural beings and happenings and human characters are just intertwined with them. And number four, triumph of good over evil, meaning that there's redemption. Because even though Max um, is lucky enough not to kill Agatha, he needs to, at the very end, redeem himself for the fact that he even 
thought about selling his soul to the devil. So he has to go and think about what he did in a hermitage. So I would like you to actually uh, uh, look at the Wolf Glen scene on YouTube. It's in two parts. Like I said, there are, ma there are many versions on YouTube. I think that's one of the best versions of the Wolf Glen scene. Richard Wagner, 1813 to 1883, German composer, theater director, conductor. Great essayist, meaning that he gives us a lot of his ideas through his writings. The best way, because it's so massive when you're talking about Richard Wagner with all of the works, his operatic works, on per se, it's sometimes to look at the people that um, influenced him and were a part of his life. I'm going to start with Ludwig Geyer. Ludwig Geyer was his stepfather. Um, his uh, biological father died um, six months after uh, Wagner was born. And Ludwig Geyer, being a German actor, I think influenced um, Wagner's um, love of uh, the theater and opera, and as well as his mother, um, because they were both in the acting field. His wife, Minna, Wagner's wife, was also a German actress, and um, she was married to Wagner for 30 years, until Cosima comes around. Cosima actually is his second wife. She is the illegitimate daughter of Liszt, Emery Dagoul and she becomes his second wife um, after Minna. Now what's interesting is we're going to be looking at the Tristan and Isolde. The muse for the Tristan and Isolde was neither of those ladies per se, but a woman by the name of Matilda Vessendonck. Matilda Vessendonck was, she and her husband were admirers and patrons of Wagner. In fact, they opened up their home to him. And um, Wagner becomes infatuated with Matilda. But their love is never consummated, just like the Tristan and Isolde love. King Ludwig of Bavaria is another important patron of Wagner's. There are 600 letters that are exchanged between the two of them. Um, and really, King Ludwig II of Bavaria was just totally in love with Wagner. In fact, Wagner writes to a friend of his about King Ludwig. He, the king, loves me, and with the deep feeling and glow of a first love, he perceives and knows everything about me and understands me as my own soul. He wants me to stay with him always. I am to be free and my own master, not his music conductor, only my very self and his friend. And we noticed that a lot of time King Ludwig II, and there are letters between the two of them, um, are usually signed, you know, your ever, ever, your devoted Ludwig, or your until, until death, your faithful friend. What's really important about that is, is, is because with the help of King Ludwig II, that Wagner had a lot of his works the way that Wagner wanted them produced, meaning that he gave him a lot of money. In fact, there's the very famous um, Bayreuth Festspielhaus, where Wagner, Wagner's works were, are performed, and work performed at that time, and it would not have been possible without King Ludwig II of Bavaria. I'd like to also mention that um, Wagner wrote a lot of controversial um, essays, as well as essays that we'll talk about that deal with his um, musical end of his production. But I'd just like to um, share with you this from Barbara Hanning's um, Concise History of Western Music about Wagner's controversial essays. Wagner is a published writer made his views known not only about music, but also about literature, drama, and even political and moral topics. The National Socialist Nazi movement in Germany appropriated his music as a symbol for 
the best of Aryan and German culture. The anti-Semitism expressed in his essay, Judaism and Music, which appeared under a pseudonym in 1850 and under Wagner's name in 1869, alienated some listeners and musicians from his music dramas. What drove Wagner to write this, he explained to Liszt, was his dislike of Meyerbeer, whose music he once admired and from whom he had sought help to get his early works performed. When critics noted the obvious influence of Meyerbeer on Wagner's music, his feelings turned against the composer. Perhaps he took offense at the implication of the suggestion. In his essay, Wagner attributed the weakness of Meyerbeer's music to the fact that he was Jewish and therefore lacked national roots, without which a composer could not have an authentic style. And I also would like to, for you to know that the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra lifted the band on the performance of Wagner's music in 1966, nearly three decades um, on the works um, favored during the Nazi regime, regime. But even in 2001, the Jewish conductor, Dan Daniel Barnboin, who was born in Argentina and raised in Israel, provoked an outcry in Israel by defying the country's informal ban on playing Wagner and performed from Tristan and Isolde in concert. So a lot of times, um, Wagner is a very controversial figure as a person, and his music also has been controversial through the years. The reason why I bring up Daniel Van Boyne is, is because I think he's one of the greatest interpreters of uh, Wagner's operas, and I hope that when you actually are seeing uh, the final scene of the Tristan and Isolde, you will use the, um, the performance with Baron as the conductor. In his essays, Richard Wagner speaks about a lot of ideas that he implements in his music after the fact, meaning that the music becomes like the example of his ideas. One idea is music and drama. The function of music was to serve dramatic expression. And he writes about this a lot. Opera und Drama in 1851 is the famous work. He talks about this. And he actually doesn't really call his works operas per se, but more music drama. Why? Because he thinks the poet, poetry, scenery, staging, action, and music come together to create a whole. He calls this whole Gesamtkunstwerk, or universal artwork, meaning that all the parts are important. It's not just the singing or the orchestral part or the words. Everything has to come together as a whole. And he sees the action of the drama as being more inner with the orchestra and the outer with the events sung. So, the orchestra becomes a very, very important part of this music drama. A person, the, the philosopher that really um, influenced Wagner about this was um, Arthur Schopenhauer, when he claimed that only instrumental music could express the full range of human emotions and expressions that underlie the phenomenal world, that lie beneath the surface appearance. This belief that only instrumental music can reveal ultimate truth and touch the will helped Wagner to shape his new concept of the leitmotif and the orchestra. His concept of the leitmotif was is that there was a particular uh, motif or a theme or a little cell of a, a melodic idea associated with a personal object or feeling. And whether or not the person was out there as the motif was being used in the music, meaning if it was just presented in the orchestral part, you knew that the, the person or the thing or the object was present. It was a way of kind of like having this sense that it was there even though you were not seeing it or the person was not singing. Schopenhauer had also said that music was the one art that embodied the deepest reality of all human experiences, our emotions and drives and does not need words. 
And so that's the reason why when we're um, looking at the musical example of Tristan and Isolde, I would like you to listen to the prelude, where the prelude actually gives you almost the whole story because he uses all the light motifs of all of the characters and you have the sense of the whole story within the prelude even before you hear one note song. A couple things I want you to keep in mind that's different about Wagner's music drama than the, a lot of the operas that we've experienced before this is, is number one, he writes his own libretti. He's a control freak, so therefore the libretto he felt was very important because of that concept of the Gesamtkunstwerk. Happen you have that if you have somebody else writing your words and someone else doing the music. So he has that sense of wholeness by actually writing his libretto. Um, as I said before, de Freischitz was a very a big influence in this work, uh, as well as the Symphony Number no. Nine of Beethoven. You're going to hear in the Tristan and the Soul to the light motifs of the various characters, and you will have this sense of continuous drama, meaning that you don't have a delineation between arias and recitatives, as we've had in other operas. Um, not used in the Tristan and Isolde, the Wagnerian tuba is a tuba that was created by Wagnerian tuba was created by Wagner. It bridged the gap between the horn and the trombone. Uh, with a horn mouthpiece. Um, he actually did had one in F and B flat. It's elliptical. It's very somber. It's used in the ring cycle. But the reason why he had to create it is, is because he wasn't getting the sound that he perceived as being important in his work. So Wagner creates the Wagnerian tuba. So if we look at the Tristan and Isolde, um, just a couple of things I just want to make mention of. First of all, it was created in 1865, three acts, the libretto is by Wagner, and it's based on a 13th century romance by Strasbourg. It takes place in legendary times at sea, um, in Cornwall and in Brittany, but the opening act is actually at sea. The characters, Tristan and Isolde, the two characters that are mentioned in the actual title of this music drama. Tristan is the a nephew of King Mark. He's bringing back Isolde as a spoil of war to be King Mark's wife. They're on this ship. Isolde remembers Tristan from her past because Tristan had actually murdered her initial love. And when they were at war, what happened was is that Tristan was wounded and Isolde had helped to heal him. Of course, he was not Tristan at that time. He was Tantris to kind of be in disguise. But all this is going to come to fruition in this um, opera as they realize how they know each other. And there's this love-hate that constantly is happening in this opening um, act, only because you know that he had killed her love, um, and yet at the same time, I don't know, there just seems to be a connection between the two of them. Bergana, Isolde's attendant, decides that she is going to create this potion, and this potion is going to be not the death potion, as possibly um, Isolde thought it would be, but a love potion, which will ultimately be a death potion because the two of them cannot be together. They cannot consummate their love. So in that final scene, you will actually see them take up the cup and drink this potion, not knowing, of course, it is the potion of love. And then at that point, it's going to be very difficult for Tristan to see Isolde as just the person that's going, that he has to bring back to King Mark. In the rest of the music drama, of course, there's this struggle between the two of them, and ultimately um, he's found out and he is wounded, and Isolde comes to him, and the two of them die at the end. 
the one thing about the leitmotifs, you will hear them in the prelude, because the two parts that I would like you to listen to is the prelude, which is the opening orchestral um, part that actually opens this music drama. He calls it a prelude. A couple things that are different about this than the overtures of other operas. Um, if you remember from the Marriage of Figaro and, and uh, Magic Flute, you're gonna notice that this is a very different sense that you get. And I wanna see what you've come up with as why you think this is different. And the other part is the finale of the first act if you don't watch the entire first act with Baron Boyne conducting, and that's also on YouTube. But when you're listening to the prelude, the one thing that I want you to notice is that you have the motifs that you will hear that are actually part of the characterization of Tristan and Isolde. The Tristan tune, which ultimately he will sing as Tristan's honor. And for Isolde, you're gonna have I drink to you. And of course, that very famous when they drink, you have the very famous, the Tristan chord, which is the four note chord of the following intervals of a minor third, diminished five, and minor seven. And if you notice that, that sense of them drinking of the cup and then finally you will hear this they look at each other with longing and you know at that point with that kind of like connection of the two of them that you're going there there's going to be trouble meaning that they're not going to be able to resist each other and ultimately will end in both of their deaths in the, um, you hear this, all of these leitmotifs, and the one thing about Wagner is, is he just doesn't separate leitmotifs, he kind of like connects them. So you have that sense of Tristan being with the Solda, and then the two of them kind of like drinking of the cup and becoming almost one, and then the fact is, is that they're now having this sense of uh, longingness between the two of them. So you have this whole sense as you're just listening, even in the orchestral part of the prelude, you haven't heard them sing a thing, but you still have this sense of the storyline. In the Tristan de Solda, there is a lot, a lot of use of chromaticism, harmonic suspensions on which the um, harmony shifts from one chord to another. And sometimes even kind of there's a surprise element of where is it going? This is very, very important to remember because um, when you're listening to it, you're gonna notice that this is going to be something that you will experience throughout the, the work. And what's even interesting about that last he gives you that question mark of where is he going with this. So I would like you to listen to the prelude, which is the opening, and see if you can see distinguishing aspects of the prelude that are, is different than just a regular overture. And then the finale of the first act, I want you to watch it, and there will be questions addressing the difference of this kind of music drama to the operas that we've experienced before this.